Welcome to another great O'Reilly webcast. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's event. Today, folks, we have Dr. Richard Grimmett with us, and he is going to talk to you about building amazing robots with the Beagle Bone Black. Dr. Grimmett has always been fascinated by computers and electronics from his very first programming project that used Fortran on punch cards. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering and a PhD in leadership studies. He also has 26 years of experience in the radar and telecommunications industries and even has one of those original brick phones. He now teaches computer science and electrical engineering at Brigham Young University, Idaho, where his office is filled with many of his robotics projects. Folks, we're very excited to have Richard with us today to present this webcast for you all. And Richard is also the author of the best-selling packed publishing book, Beagle Bone Robotic Projects. Folks, I would like to start the event by going over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. First, you'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Richard. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Richard, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure we see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. The Twitter widget will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today, folks, our hashtag is Littlebone, all one word. If you should have any trouble with the webcast, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have trouble, just post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. If you have any choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know. We are recording today's webcast and we will have the archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Richard for his presentation. Hello, Richard. Hi there. Hey, thanks, everyone, for joining us. <clears throat> As he mentioned the streaming thing, I'm, I'm sure many of you are streaming the uh, World Cup games. So hopefully that will be um, compatible with uh, being on the call today. Uh, as you, as you mentioned, I'm really excited about talking about robotics. Um, and have been in the industry for a long time. And I'm especially excited just to be a part of robotics at this particular time because it's an exciting time when not just engineers, but lots of individuals can participate in building and operating really, really cool robots. And I find myself involved with a lot of different projects, and many of them are, in fact, not even uh, engineering students, but just students who have an interest. So I'm excited to share that with you today. Hopefully, this yeah, hopefully the screen will uh, be able to show you now some of the kinds of robots that uh, we've been building. Uh, they're really ex um, interesting robots. Um, there's a, robots for a lot of different purposes and a lot of different um, form factors. So as you can see here, we have walking robots. We have crawling robots, we have sailing robots, we have flying robots, and all of these projects are projects that uh, I've fortunately been able to work on with some of my students. Um, we're going to go through some of these today. We're going to talk about some of the capabilities. Uh, I won't be able, of course, to share with you uh, how to do each and every one, every robot that's shown here or get into too much on the specifics, but I do want to talk to you about some of the different capabilities that you might be interested in, and especially how the new uh, processors and open source software can help you be very successful at uh, creating your own robotics projects. As I mentioned, we are really at an amazing point in robotics. 
um, it really reminds me very much of the time when the first uh, personal computers were coming out. Uh, as Yasmina mentioned, um, my very first programming class was punch cards. And I can still remember in college having a friend who bought one of the very first IBM PCs that had two floppies and uh, a green uh, monitor. And we thought we had just experienced the most, uh, you know, technologically groundbreaking uh, advance ever. Um, and as we've seen, that has uh, really developed and transformed our world in many ways. And uh, what's significant about that is that many of those developments were actually the result of people working in the industry outside of the large universities and outside of the large companies. So it was really a, a very much a grassroots effort that made all that work. Um, the nice thing about today is that having uh, an opportunity to work in robotics is actually available to almost anyone. And that really has been um, powered uh, or enabled by uh, a whole generation of uh, inexpensive embedded processors. Um, it really provides all of us with the capability to start not from designing the actual um, processors themselves, but using a set of processors that are inexpensive and small and easy to use to start our projects. Additionally, there's a lot of uh, inexpensive peripherals to go with that. So capabilities that in the past might have cost uh, several hundred to several thousands of dollars are now made available at a fraction of that cost. The last uh, thing that really helps all of us as we try to develop our robots and our robotic capabilities is that there's a large and growing set of open source software. So this software uh, is available. It, is, uh, it has no licensing, uh, particular licensing costs associated with it. You can use it. Uh, you can improve it. And then you can resubmit it to the community for others to use as well. And so there's a large set of that open source software that really provides all of us with a set of capabilities to make our robots pretty amazing with a very small effort. I mentioned the embedded processors. I just want to point out that there's uh, actually quite a variety, um, and I haven't even captured all of them here on this slide. Um, perhaps uh, I should at least mention the Arduino, as it was one of the very first to, to really provide the hobbyists the opportunity to work in the robotic space. And it has been very successful, and it's, a, it's a, a great little processor, and I often use it uh, on my own projects. And when people come to me and ask uh, what kind of a, a system they should build as a very first project, oftentimes I'll mention the Arduino as that, uh, as that capability. But <clears throat> since then, there's been some uh, excellent additions to the opportunities that we have to actually do uh, robotics, and that namely is the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone Black. They both are very powerful. They are both um, uh, have all the functionality that we need in, in many cases. They offer the opportunity to, to uh, actually uh, program directly in Linux, which is a, a huge benefit because of the open source software and the drivers that are available. And again, the, the, probably the, the nicest thing is that they are very inexpensive. So this kind of processing capability in the past, again, might have cost several hundred to several thousands of dollars, and now we can get that for, for much less, which makes our robotics process, our robotic, robotic projects much less expensive. So I often counsel with my students about which processor to cho choose. And uh, so just some ideas about uh, why we might want to choose the BeagleBone Black. So one of the reasons we might want to choose the BeagleBone Black is because of its, uh, it supports the Linux operating system. And the Linux operating sy system, when we use it, provides it with an entire set of capabilities that are very powerful. One of those capabilities is the ability to simply plug in via the USB port hardware and then 
be able to use that to enable capability in our robotic space. That hardware comes with drivers that are either available or already in the operating system. So communicating with that hardware becomes very simple and straightforward. The other neat thing about the BeagleBone Black is it, and, and Linux is that it provides the opportunity to add really interesting functionality like vision or speech or device control. And again, the open source software community uh, provides that via, uh, via, again, open source or free software that allows us to, again, use that capability without having to pay licensing or even pay for the software. The Beagle Black, Bone Bo excuse me, the Beagle Bone Black is small, and that makes it easy to put into our robotics project. And its power requirements are reasonable, certainly less than an amp if we're using it in a in a fairly straightforward project. Um, those kind of power uh, requirements can easily be met with a small um, cell phone battery or perhaps an RC um, battery, and that allows us to keep our projects. Um, mobile. And of course, it doesn't hurt that it's inexpensive. Again, this same functionality in the past might have cost several thousand dollars, and now it's much, much less than that. So one of the very first questions I ask uh, people who come to my office and say, hey, I've got a robotics project, can you help me? Yes, well, what do you want your robot to do? And these are the kinds of things that uh, people talk about as they talk about their robotics projects and what they'd like them to do. So first on the list, almost always, is they want some sort of movement. So they want the robot to be actually be able to move around. And so the first um, kind of uh, decision they have to make is whether they're going to use a wheeled or track vehicle or if they want to do some sort of walking robot. Another capability that they'll often talk about or mention is that they want the robot to be able to find barriers, or at least not run into walls or perhaps run off the edge of a table. So that's kind of a fundamental capability of a robot. Now, occasionally, they will tell me that they want their robot to listen. So one of the, the very neat functionalities that uh, we can add to a robot today is the ability to uh, give our robot voice commands, and that uh, makes our robot appear actually much more intelligent than it actually is. Uh, it also allows us to do some really neat things we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, sometimes we want our robot to speak, to give us information. Uh, occasionally, we want our robot to see. We may want our robot to see the, the world for several reasons. One of the reasons might be that we want to track an object or we might want to find movement, or we might want to uh, understand what the world around us looks like. Occasionally, uh, our robots will want to know where their location is. This is particularly true of robots that want to go out of doors, and uh, particularly of our robots that want to fly. So one of the important pieces of information, uh, if we want our robots to return, is where are they? And of course, we want this all to happen autonomously. So we don't want our robot to have a whole bunch of uh, cables and wires uh, connected back to some computer, because then uh, we, everyone knows that we're controlling the robot directly. And so we'd like to have our robot have some sort of autonomous nature. Now, occasionally, uh, people come and want to do a robotic project that flies. And so I will show you an example for exa of a quadcopter and an airplane and some of the other ways we can actually use these same principles in a flying robot. I've had students who have built a sailing robot. Uh, that is an, a remote control ro um, remote controlled sailboat that actually was able to sail itself. And we'll talk about that for a few minutes. And one of the funnest projects that we've been working on and we continue to work on is a robot that can swim. So we've actually done some work, and there's a lot of really interesting work out there in the idea of building robots uh, as a uh, ROV, a remote-operated vehicle. So we can actually have our robot go underwater and give us some indication of what's going on below the surface. 
So what I'd like to do is walk through each of these and talk just a little bit about them and how uh, how we can actually enable this kind of capability. Again, I'm not going to give a, a explicit or complete details, but just some ideas of how you might be able to enable this particular functionality in your robot. So a lot of my students like to build wheeled or track vehicles. These wheeled or track vehicles normally have two DC motors and can, their direction and speed can be controlled by these DC motors. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the BeagleBone Black actually comes with the GPIO pins. And we might be tempted to try to drive these motors directly from the BeagleBone Black. But generally, that can be challenging because the BeagleBone Black can't quite supply enough power so that we can control both of those motors. Now, for, for some very small platforms, that might be the case. But generally, uh, if we put enough um, additional capability on top of our robot and then ask it to move around, those motors are going to require a certain amount of current. So I have found it perhaps most useful to use a DC motor controller that connects to the BeagleBone Black over USB. This provides the uh, opportunity for me to connect a, an additional battery directly to the DC motor controller. And then I can program the speed and direction of my motors very easily using the BeagleBone Black talking over USB to the motor controller. That also offloads that motor control um, capability to the um, DC motor controller and en enables my Beagle Be BeagleBone Black to uh, do other things perhaps like find barriers or uh, perhaps use the vision control systems. Um, these DC motor controllers are fairly inexpensive. There are several that are available. Uh, there are several uh, versions that can control two DC motors. Uh, if you need more control than two DC motors, I have uh, had platforms where um, my students have asked to use four DC motors. Um, and in which case there are DC motor controllers that control more than that, or because they're connected over USB, you can simply connect more than one. And uh, that can be very useful. One of the more popular ways um, to move the robot around, it seems like my students really like uh, this particular capability, is to uh, build some sort of biped or quadruped robot. So here's two examples. One's a biped robot. It's fairly simple. It has four servos. And uh, by controlling those four servos, we can get our robot to walk. It can also um, turn around. It can dance. The four servos are pretty limited. Uh, the, the leg systems with the four servos are fairly limited. Um, it is fairly straightforward to add more servos than that. Uh, you'll often see um, six degree of freedom uh, legged robots, which simply means that there are six servos per leg. And that provides more uh, flexibility in what your robot can do. Now, when you add those servos, you will need to be able to control those. Um, and here's another situation where we might be tempted to control the servos through the GPIO pins of the BeagleBone Black. It certainly has the capability. But with more than just a couple of servos, we often run out of the um, power capability to drive those servos. And so for most of the projects that uh, my students have been involved with and that we've built, we've added a servo motor controller. This servo motor controller can um, connect, you can connect up to 18 servos. Uh, in the case of our quadruped, we have 12 servos. and uh, again, the nice thing is the uh, servo controller controls the servos directly, and we talk to the servo controller via USB. And that provides a very clean interface. It also provides the opportunity for us to use the processing power on the BeagleBone Black to do other perhaps computational, uh, computationally intensive um, activities. Not only do we want our robot to move around, you'll probably want it to perhaps find some bar barriers. 
uh, a robot that runs into the wall isn't particularly attractive. So we have uh, we have discovered a couple of ways that it's very useful to be able to find barriers. Um, one of those is using a sonar sensor. Um, the other way that we uh, the other capability that we often add to our robots is an infrared sensor. And both of those work uh, on the principle of sending out a signal, sensing uh, when you get a return, and the time it takes for that return to come back allows us to find out how far our particular barrier is away. There are, again, several ways of adding this capability. Um, we could, again, use the GPIO uh, pins for this particular capability. However, one of the challenges of doing that with the BeagleBone Black is that the Linux operating system is not a real-time operating system. That is, the time it takes to actually respond and actually put signals out and bring signals in will be dependent upon the load of the processor and what other things might be going on. So from that particular capability uh, or restriction, oftentimes we'll want to add this capability, again, connecting via USB. And there are a couple of uh, possibilities to do that. Those are outlined in the book. But you can buy uh, sonar sensors, for example, that talk via USB. Now, they're a little more expensive than the ones that don't. Uh, and so oftentimes my students start to figure out, well, hey, I can't buy three or four of these. That's pretty expensive. But what we have discovered is by taking that sensor and putting it on a servo, we can actually move the direction of the sensor. So instead of using a, an entire bank of sensors, oftentimes we'll use one sensor with a servo. And it will allow us to see, or at least sense the barriers around us, and without having to buy again a, an entire set of, of sensors. And that has worked well on some of our projects. Another capability that you will want to consider for your particular robotic project is the ability to listen. So um, most of my students don't even think of this as a possibility because they think it would be incredibly hard to create a system that will actually be able to listen to our voice commands and then, re and then respond appropriately. But here's where our uh, open source software really helps us. There's a package called Pocket Sphinx. It's uh, developed, uh, developed by uh, Carnegie Mellon, which is a university here in the United States. And it provides us with the capability where we can just give it an audio um, piece of information, and it will parse that piece of audio information and then um, attempt to discover what words were spoken and then return those back to us so that we can do something with them. And this is very powerful functionality. It works wonderfully on the BeagleBone Black. And um, so what we can do is add a USB um, sound card that has both an audio in and an audio out, and add a microphone. And now we can issue standard voice commands, and our robot will respond. And uh, this makes for a very impressive robot, again, the nice thing is that we don't have to do the, the bulk of the software. It is provided for us from an open source perspective. Now, some people are actually tempted to put an audio cape on the BeagleBone Black, and that, um, that can work fine. But I have found the very inexpensive USB sound cards to be just as uh, fully functional and much less expensive. So I'll often just simply add a, a very inexpensive USB a sound card and a microphone to the project, and it will uh, make it all look very, very impressive. Of course, if we're going to talk to our robot, we'll want it to talk back to us. And we can add that capability again very, very simply by using a program called eSpeak. Again, this is an open source piece of software where we simply type in the words we want our computer to speak and it will speak those um, via the sound card again. So in this case, we add our sound card and a powered speaker, uh, a small powered speaker to our robotic project, 
And now, not only can we get information in using voice commands, we can get information out from our robot using um, speech. And uh, this really significantly, uh, this is very impressive capability. Uh, again, as I uh, demonstrate our robotics projects, the ability to listen and to speak seems to be uh, very impressive and interesting uh, for many people. Well, if our robot, of course, can listen and speak, an additional capability we may want to add is the opportunity to see. And this is, this is where uh, using the Linux operating system with the BeagleBone Black is extremely powerful because we can connect a standard USB webcam that are very inexpensive to our BeagleBone Black. And then we add an additional open source software package called OpenCV, which is a very powerful, full-featured uh, video processing package. We can add that to our uh, project and now get information in via the USB webcam. We can certainly take pictures of the world around us, and that might be interesting. But by adding some additional code to the OpenCV um, capability, we can actually do things like track color. So some of my students have built robots where they had a colored uh, ball of a certain color, and the robot was able to follow that ball. I've had other robotics projects where they were able to detect motion and then the robot would respond to that motion. And so these are powerful capabilities. Um, I've actually had projects where my students have done um, face recognition. And there are um, examples of that out in the community. So doing things like facial recognition, uh, motion detection, and, and color detection are very simple and straightforward using the OpenCV environment. For those robots that are um, extremely mobile, uh, and that some of the robots I'm going to talk about in a, in a few minutes really are, you may want to also add the opportunity to find out where you are. And uh, fortunately, GPS provides us with that possibility. So this is a capability we often add to our flying robots, because we don't want them to fly uh, and fly away and never come back. So uh, we have discovered that adding to a GPS is very straightforward. There are many GPS uh, receivers that can connect via USB. And again, that provides our uh, Beagle Bone Black with the opportunity to um, use, that, those, you use those pieces of information to actually discover where it is. It's also quite straightforward, once we know where we are, to calculate the bearing and distance to any kind of waypoints we might want to set. So oftentimes we talk about having our robot return to us, or perhaps our robot wants to fly a certain pattern, and we can use GPS to find those pieces of or where we are and then plan our trip or our route to the other locations that we want to go to. Now, of course, we want to do all this autonomously. We want our, our robot to do this all autom automatically. And uh, the nice thing about that is that, that there are actually several formats that let us allow our robot to be autonomous, yet still give ourselves uh, the opportunity to be in contact with our robot. The simplest one of this is just simply using a, a wireless uh, keyboard. So many of my uh, of our most simple robotics projects use a wireless keyboard almost as a gamepad, and it can allow us to directly control the robot, or perhaps override control if we feel like the robot somehow is going in a situation that it might uh, um, have be a, a situation where the robot might be damaged. So it allows us to again have direct control. Uh, but the, probably the most popular way for us to stay in contact with our robot, even though it may be deciding for itself what to do, is to add a wireless LAN link 
to our robot. So this is very popular with my students. Uh, we add a wireless LAN um, card, or actually just a wireless LAN dongle, which are very inexpensive to the robot. And then the robot, um, we can communicate with the robot. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, using a VNC server, we can actually see what the robot sees. We can often uh, look at the information the robot is using to decide uh, how it's going to move and what it's going to do. And it also allows us to edit uh, our programs and change what we think we want our robot to do. So that's probably the most popular way that my students choose to actually communicate with the robot. We have had a couple of times where we wanted to communicate uh, longer distances, longer than a wireless LAN can provide. And some of my students have chosen to use uh, a format called XB to do that kind of communication. So there are XB modules that are much higher power than wireless LAN and can go uh, at much greater distances than a wireless LAN connection might. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't provide us with the kind of bandwidth to do things like look at video, but it does at least provide us with the opportunity if we think our robot is getting too far away or is uh, in a situation where it might be damaged, that we can override its own autonomous control and perhaps send it back to us or at least stop the action that's, uh, that's causing some concern. Um, I will mention, I didn't put it on the slide, but I have seen projects that have actually used uh, the cell phone network to communicate with their robot. And uh, that's a very powerful idea. The big challenge, of course, is that it um, is connecting to a cellular network, and that can be challenging uh, for some networks. So uh, while I think it's an interesting idea, uh, I have discovered in our attempts, oftentimes, it's uh, been difficult to get it all to work because you actually have to flow through, the information has to flow through the cellular network and you have to connect to it, and um, that can be somewhat challenging, but it's at least interesting. Now, that's all the capabilities. I want to just mention a couple of different kinds of robots that we have built and that we are kind of excited about, hopefully maybe to inspire some ideas uh, with those of you who might be thinking about doing a project. One of the projects that I get a lot of interest in, and I've had lots of students uh, work with and build, are robots that fly. And one of our most popular robots that fly, of course, is the quadcopter. Uh, as you're probably aware, quadcopters are, are very much in the news. They're very powerful. And um, there are lots of different versions from very small quadcopters to very large quadcopters. And these quadcopters are almost always controlled via an RC uh, link. That is, we have a link that we send uh, information to the quadcopter and directly control it. What my students have, uh, have, uh, um, have played with and are experimenting with is the idea of a quadcopter that can fly itself. And so what we normally do in, from that perspective is buy a basic flight controller board and then we control that via servo control that comes from the BeagleBone Black. Now, I know out there there are a couple of projects that are experimenting with having the BeagleBone Black do all of the flight control. That's a very difficult problem, again, because of the non-real-time nature of the BeagleBone Black. And if we're going to ask it to do other things, perhaps like vision control, uh, that can be challenging. So what we've decided is that the uh, we have left the actual flight control, which means the ability to stabilize the motors so that the, the quadcopter itself will stay upright in a fairly stable condition. We have decided that that most effective way of doing that is leaving that to the flight controller board. And then we provide, through the Beagle Bone Black, the capability to go up or down, left or right, uh, turn around, those kinds of things. And then on the BeagleBone Black, we have added capability like web cameras, um, GPS, uh, sonar sensors, other pieces of information that allow us then to uh, have our quadcopter be autonomous. Uh, as you can imagine, 
we can set up a, a capability of allowing our quadcopter to fly a certain pattern or perhaps follow a certain color ball or, uh, or at least know its surrounding as it enters the rope. So some very interesting and neat opportunities there. This area is just, uh, just starting to become uh, a very interesting and exciting area uh, for, uh, for our experimentation in the robotics world. As I mentioned before, we've actually had a, a sailboat project. So uh, my students took an RC sailboat and uh, made it autonomous uh, from a robotics perspective. So what we did there, uh, the sailboat itself is controlled by two servos, one that controls the, the direction of the sails and the other which controls the rudder. And so that uh, is fairly straightforward to control via our servo controller. The interesting part is that we added a, a, a wind sensor to the top of the sail and we are able to then sense the wind direction and based on wind direction and a GPS module which tells us where we are, um, plot how we should move the rudder and the sails to get to a set of waypoints. So that was an interesting and exciting project. They actually added the XB so that they could uh, keep track of where the robot was and what it thought it was doing. And so we used the long range XP to do that. And that was a, a fun and interesting project. The next project, uh, our set of projects is what's fun and interesting. And uh, you'll see here a couple of different incantations of it was we decided we wanted to build a remote operated vehicle. And that simply means a vehicle that can go underwater and be controlled and so we uh, started and built, built that. And we've actually had a couple of versions of that now. Uh, you'll see the first one, one is the, um, uh, we actually used an aluminum pot to build our ROV. So uh, that was built by a set of, um, that was built by a set of electrical engineering students. And uh, it's actually quite easy to find the uh, plastic bubbles for the front of the ROV. So they built that. Uh, the neat thing or interesting thing about ROVs, of course, is that the uh, ROVs are, or the, the, the brushless DC motors work just fine under water. And so uh, the students thought that was quite interesting that they were actually able to take um, motors that were designed for RC controlled airplanes and um, actually do something with those underwater. Uh, in addition, or I guess the interesting, the next interesting part of that is our students, uh, we actually had a mechanical engineering group who decided that the uh, aluminum pot idea wasn't all that uh, exciting. So now they are redesigning our ROV using uh, PVC pipe. And that has been uh, uh, an interesting and, a, and I will have to say a more stable design. So it's, it's been good that we've had the mechanical engineers involved in that process. So this has been a fun one. Students have been down in the pool uh, playing with uh, the ROV, looking at underwater, and it, uh, it's been very exciting. Uh, let's see. So the neat thing, I think, and uh, one of the things I tell everyone who comes to me and talks about their projects is that you can be successful. Uh, the Beagle Bull Black is very forgiving. Uh, it is pretty hard to destroy it. We have had one case where we actually have destroyed a Beagle Bull Black in, in all of our projects, but it's very, very uh, rare to do that. Um, there is a lot of open source software capability out there, and there's lots of help from the community. So it's, uh, it's quite um, easy to go on and see what's going on with other projects. People are very willing to help. And the Beagle Bone Black itself is improving, and it's making itself even easier uh, to use and in your projects. Here's some advice. Um, and uh, this might speak to some of your uh, questions that are coming in. I'm going to try to 
leave about the last little bit of time here to, to talk to with the, about those. Um, I generally am a bit reluctant to have my students use the GPIO pins. Uh, that comes just from experience, I guess. I have discovered that using the GPIO pins can be a bit challenging. Um, I don't, uh, so there, there are a couple of uh, aspects to that. Uh, controlling, for example, a servo motor or a DC motor uh, can be very uh, challenging only from the power requirements. And looking at any kind of real-time uh, GPIO capability is challenging from the real-time um, systems capability. I have, however, used some sensors using an I2C or SPI interface. And uh, so if you're a real fan of the I2C or SPI interface, which are both synchronous serial interfaces, uh, that can work uh, using the GPIO. And I have uh, used sensors from that perspective. The thing I have found is that there's lots of USB capability. So I generally, if I can use the USB, I will, only because it's a standard interface it's very difficult to destroy a chip using the, the standard USB. And communicating with the chip is very, very straightforward. I would also encourage you to start with the basics. Um, don't try to build um, the robot from um, our R2-D2. Or actually, R2-D2 might be pretty easy, but C3PO may be a little harder. So don't try to do that right off the bat. I tell my students often begin with the basics, create a small mobile platform, then add capabilities. You are going to have issues. Um, you are going to have challenges. Learn how to work through those with help from the web. Again, there are a lot of great groups um, that can work and help you with that. And I often tell beginners that they may want to try an Arduino first, only because it's a little uh, more straightforward and especially for those individuals have, who have very little or no programming experience. Uh, playing and using the Arduino gives you a set of experiences and um, really, uh, again, some background that really can help you sometimes. So I want to pause here, and I want to just look at a few of the questions to see if I can, can uh, respond to some of those. Um, Oh, so again, let me just speak to a little bit to the USB. And, and people have talked to me about this before. Uh, and this may be this may be um, this may be something that's again just me. I really prefer the USB only because it is so straightforward and easy to both uh, program and then find issues. I have used the SPI and I2C interface a little bit. Uh, but I'm a little reluctant to do that based on past experiences, just because my, my students have struggled quite a bit with that. So um, I know there are good examples out there. And if you have a favorite sensor or um, fundamental uh, functionality that can only be provided that way, I think it's absolutely great uh, to use that. I have been a little bit, um, a little bit challenged by that. Uh, and I have not yet uh, found a situation where I didn't find a USB controller that helped me overcome that. Uh, there are inexpensive USB controllers that work as an ADC, for example. Now, uh, I know that the uh, BeagleBone Black has an ADC on board, but it is very limited in the voltages that it can actually look at. Uh, that, however, might be a case where if I had one of those kinds of things, I might think about using the, the GPIO. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, Tales from the Trenches on cellular connectivity. Um, you know, I'm not uh, completely, sh uh, I don't know where to point you. I, maybe there's a way to, if you can get a hold of me via email. There's an excellent project out there out of the UK where they did a remote operated uh, quadcopter using the cellular connectivity. And uh, they actually offered that as a product, I believe. So that might be a great resource is in, in understanding that. We tried to recreate that here and had problems connecting to our local cellular networks. Uh, but we live in Idaho, and uh, we don't have the greatest cellular network opportunities. So that could be, be challenging. 
Um, uh, now, a, a number of these, by the way, uh, questions, I will tell you if you want specifics, the book tries to cover those in very direct detail. And uh, I will tell you that I was motivated to write the book because I've had so many students who struggled with some of the basic functionality. And I really tried to write that such that it would give them a step-by-step -step guide of how to be successful. Now, the challenge with writing any book like that is things change. Uh, and so as you walk through and do those things, be aware that things are changing. There may be better and easier ways to do that. So for example, someone talks about a real-time preemptive patch. Um, that I haven't played with much. I was just uh, made aware of it uh, not too long ago. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to look at that and see if that's a possibility to help with these real-time issues. The concern I've always had and cont would continue to have is that the BeagleBone Black has limited processing capability. And I often like to add a, a video processing um, aspect to my projects. And that can be quite uh, processing intensive. So if at the same time I'm trying to do the video processing, I'm using the same processor to do um, things in real time, then perhaps the real time works, but my video or my yeah my video processing uh, suffers. Some of you have asked me about which OS to use. When I first started using the uh, BeagleBone Black, I chose to, to load the BeagleBone Black with Ubuntu. And that was an interesting decision. I just simply wasn't very familiar with Angstrom, which was the initial uh, offering that was placed on the BeagleBone Black in the two gigabyte space. I wasn't very familiar or comfortable with how it worked. And I had a significant more a set of experiences with Ubuntu. So I used Ubuntu, and that's the operating system I use in the book. Now, since that time, the newest versions of BeagleBone Black, RevC, come with Debian on the card. And I have not gone back and reevaluated that Debian distribution or all of the capabilities that I've implemented on Ubuntu, how you would do them on Debian. I think it would be very straightforward to go back and redo those. Uh, I just haven't had the time. And because my system works really well the way it is right now, I, uh, I'm, I'm loath to go back just because it's so much easier to go forward and simply use Ubuntu. Uh, I have a Ubuntu computer in my office uh, only because I teach some computer science classes. So again, for me, it was fairly straightforward which operating system you use. Um, if I were starting today with the BeagleBone Black, I probably would have spent more time with the Debian uh, distribution to see how it might have worked. Uh, someone talks about, can we use the SPY uh, like you do on Arduino? And the answer is yes. Uh, I have used the I2C interface uh, GPIO pins on BeagleBone Black. I have not yet used the SPY interface, but I've heard lots of people who have been successful at that. Um, uh, again, I have tended to focus more on using USB capabilities, but I believe the SPI interface is certainly one you could use. Ah, someone asks about the BeagleBone Black uh, compared to the Raspberry Pi. So this is an excellent question. And um, I, I will tell you, I'm sitting in my office right now surrounded by robots, and I have a lot of BeagleBone Blacks. I also have a lot of Raspberry Pis in my office. And I have a lot of Arduinos. And I have uh, some Odroids, which are even more powerful processors out of Korea. And uh, so here's what I would say. I use, I use all of those. And I have been su successfully using all of those. Here's what I would say general, generally as a rule of thumb. The Raspberry Pi has a larger uh, community that follows it. So finding help can be a little easier. It's a little less powerful than the Raspberry Pi for some capabilities. So specifically, some of my students use the Connect, the old Xbox Connect, for some of their projects to get a 3D view of the world. They can use that on the BeagleBone Black, but we have not been able to get it to work on the Raspberry Pi. And uh, although I haven't checked recently, 
uh, no one that I know of in the community has been able to get to work on the Raspberry Pi. So I guess my default at this point for using a processor is probably the BeagleBone Black, only because it's a great uh, balance between uh, processing power and support. There are all kinds of new processors coming out, by the way. This is one of the really exciting parts of being where we are, uh, doing what we are. And it's very exciting that we could uh, begin to even talk about being able to compare all these different, uh, these different uh, processors. One of the challenges right now, by the way, and I'll, I'll admit this, although I share no blame for it, is that it's, it's somewhat difficult to find Beagle Bulb Blacks right now. Um, but they are working hard, I know, to, uh, to change that and put more stock out there. So that can be a bit challenging right now is to, is to find a, uh, a Beagle Bone Black. But again, I, I think any of those could be a great starting point for a robot. The key is just to go out and start building. Ah, someone asked about battery. Which battery do I use? I use uh, one of two batteries, depending on my project. So one of my favorite batteries to use is simply one of these cell phone uh, batteries that have a USB output that are normally uh, used to actually charge a cell phone. They're very inexpensive, especially if you watch sales. Uh, I, look, I tend to look for those batteries that actually have two USB outputs because I'll use one for the BeagleBolt Black and one for a powered USB hub. You need to use the powered USB hub if you're going to use wireless LAN or use webcams. I like to use those because they're very inexpensive and very easy to interface. So I just buy some USB cables, buy the battery, and use that. Now, for some of my larger projects, we'll actually use RC um, LiPo batteries and, um, and then use regulators to regulate those down to our 5 volts. So for example, on my tracked platform, uh, I'll use a 7.2 volt uh, lithium poly RC battery because it, it really lets my robot run for a very long time. And then I'll use a regulator to regulate that down to 5 volts to supply that to my BeagleBone Black. Um, I do the same thing on quadcopters quite often. Is uh, so either of those two work really well for me. Let's see anything else we could talk about. So again, thanks for being a part of the call and listening, and uh, be, uh, more than anything, being excited about robotics. Uh, I uh, have only been teaching for about four years. Um, I spent 26 years in the industry. In fact, in my office t right now, and I, I show my students this, I have a brick phone from the 1990s, and I have Google Glass. And I tell my students this is an excellent example of how far technology has come and how dramatic technology can change. And we've seen it in personal computers. We've seen it in cell phones. I'm convinced we're going to see it in robotics. So the robotics of a few years from now is going to be fundamentally different than the robots that we're seeing today. So, um, so it's pretty exciting. Um, but we're going to go through some interesting phases where we're going to have some things that won't work. And there are going to be lots of interesting challenges and changes. The thing I guess I'm especially interested in, excited about is that there's a great support community of people to help you be successful. And that support community uh, available online uh, can really make a huge difference in, again, helping you solve your problem. So one last slide. Again, this is just an example of some of the projects that we're working on. I'm hoping that your projects will be just as neat or even more exciting than these. Um, I, I do give uh, presentations uh, to a lot of the different uh, community groups. Uh, the thing I find especially interesting is how much the young people get excited about robotics. So the idea of being able to tell uh, the robot to do something like dance and have it do it uh, has been an, 
has been very rewarding. And uh, they, the uh, again, the young people especially uh, see that as a very exciting and interesting area. And it's been helpful for me in trying to recruit people to consider um, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math careers at the university level. All right. So I think I've covered everything I need to cover. Uh, any more questions or? questions that just came in. Let me get them for you really quick here, Richard. Um, All right. Okay, Earl would like to know, do you have a blog or a website with updates? Um, the best way to get updates for the book is to go to Pack Publishing. Okay, and folks, we'll push that URL out to you in just one second. Okay. So every time we find an issue, and by the way, if you find issues with the book, and we know there are, uh, please send them in. Uh, even if it's hey, there's something new and different uh, that should, you should consider, uh, we'd love to see that. We are uh, considering uh, at BYU-Idaho uh, starting a website to talk more specifically about the projects I just have shared with you. Um, a lot of these projects, uh, there's a lot of information already available online, but oftentimes people say, hey, is there a place where it's all together where it, that gives me a real step-by-step? -step? And so we're we're looking at that right now, what that might look like. Super. Um, Ivan would like to know, what programming languages do you use, and is Python fast enough for some kinds of tasks? That is a great question. Uh, I have found that I, I am a lifelong C programmer, and I've used uh, C and object, I used Objective-C many, many years ago, but C and C++ and a little bit of C Sharp. But I have found myself over the last two years moving a lot to Python. Uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, you can do a, a powerful set of um, things in a very small set of code. And I have not yet found any problem with Python being too slow for the kinds of things that I wanted to do. So that's a great question. And I, I will tell you that, yeah, again, I, I have found myself moving more and more to Python just because it's so easy to use. And looks like one final question here from Maria. What time do these projects take? Are there any that can be done in under 10 hours? So um, here, that, an excellent question again. Here's what I would suggest. Um, on the basic projects, uh, what I would start with, again, if it, as students come to me and say, I really want to learn robotics or I want to start learning robotics, I almost always start them with that small wheeled platform. And the very first thing I have them do is actually get the platform to move. Um, that kind of a little project could easily be done in under 10 hours. And it would familiarize them with the Big O Bone Black. It would familiarize them with a little bit of programming. It would familiarize with them how to connect things up. And it's very rewarding to actually see the, the actual device move around a little bit. Then, for example, for example adding a barrier um, sensor would only take maybe an hour. And now you can sense barriers and stop your vehicle before it hits the wall. Then you can add other capabilities. Uh, one of the neat things I then add generally is the speech recognition because it's so powerful to be able to tell your robot what to do and see that happen. That might be another five hours. But by then, it actually might be much less than that because you've begun to be familiar with the individual steps and how to be successful. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug the book, but only just a little bit. I will tell you that I wrote the book not because I thought it was going to make me wealthy, but because... I really just wanted to organize the information. There's a lot of information out there. Organize it and make it easy for my students to go step by step to be successful. And the book is organized that way. So each chapter is a different functionality. And so you can grab that chapter that speaks to your specific functionality and make your, uh, make your project successful. Now, some of you may be mentoring younger students. And that happens quite often where you're working with a student perhaps that's in high school. And um, again, what we can do or what you can do is take just a chapter or two and make them successful at just that step. And as they begin to get confidence, they're going to look for 
more opportunities. And then, of course, they'll move outside the book to the communities at large. Excellent. Folks, with that, I don't see any additional questions. So, Richard, we are going to say a very big thank you to you for spending your time with us today and for presenting a really outstanding webcast and sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us. Well, thanks for the opportunity. It's been great. Folks that attended our webcast today, we thank you for attending and hope you benefited from it. And a big thank you to those of you that sent in your questions because having your questions really adds so much to our event, so we do appreciate that. And finally, just want to let you know, if you didn't open that group chat, do open it before you leave. I pushed out a code to you all to save you some money today as a thank you for attending the webcast. O'Reilly has Richard's ebook available today for 50% off, so we hope you take advantage of that. And then some of you were asking about the print version, and I pushed out the link to Richard's publisher, Pack Publishing, right to his um, book. Right there, you can get the print version there if you're interested in that. As well, he's got some other books, so do take a look. He has a lot of fun things and great things um, to inspire and motivate um, children of all ages, let's say. And these projects look like they are outstanding. So we do hope you take advantage of all of these things. Again, thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.